We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. I mean, come on, no one plans to get sick. And yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. I survived cancer, a stroke, and COVID 19, and I'm still here. I also survived our broken healthcare system. And I want to help you survive it too. So let's go make healthcare suck less together because we're all out of patience. Hello, friends, and welcome back. A quick reminder before we get started as always, if you like the show and you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave a like, a review, a rating, maybe, or don't. Up to you. That's perfectly fine. On the show today, health technology researcher and returning champion Susanna Fox joins me along with Vicky Rideout, a researcher on children and media to discuss the findings of their brand new study, Coping with COVID-19, How Young People Use Digital Media to Manage Their Mental Health. Now, what is absolutely fascinating about this study and their results is that there are actually two sets of data. One concluded in 2018 And then with the pandemic, they repeated the same study and compared the differences. Spoiler, the results were shocking and yet not shocking, as you can imagine. So before we get started, allow me to take a moment to thank the generous sponsors who made this study possible. Hope Lab, California Health Care Foundation, and Common Sense Media. All right, here we go. Susanna, Vicky, thank you so much for coming on Out of Patience. We're here to talk about all things kids, teenagers, young adults, mental health, social media, and who knew that it was all a big mess? Am I right? <laughs> who wants to start? Especially during the pandemic. What pandemic? <laughs> oh, that pandemic. Well, what I'd love to do is, is share a little bit about how this research came to be and then get into the findings. When I was at the Pew Research Center and looking at the intersection of health and technology in the early 2000s when dinosaurs roamed the internet, I kept seeing reports by this really great researcher who worked at the Kaiser Family Foundation who was looking at a very different age group. I was looking at adults 18 and older, and Vicki Rideout was looking at some of the same issues, but really focused on kids. And scroll forward, in 2018, I had the opportunity to do a survey of teens and young adults, 14 to 22-year-olds. And I said, I have teenagers, but I know that that does not qualify me to be a researcher and field a survey focused on, on teenagers, focused on that age group. So I contacted Vicki and said, would you be interested in working with me? And thank goodness she said yes. Um, and I want to ask Vicky what your impression was when we started working together. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, it's like the story you just told is kind of like the exact opposite of the truth. Because when I was um, <laughs> doing research at the Kaiser Family Foundation, I was seeing this esteemed researcher from the Pew Research Center who I admired so much. And I basically saw the work that she was doing, you were doing on technology and health among adults. And I thought, well, maybe I can try to make a contribution doing similar research among teens. And so that's kind of really the first time I got involved in doing direct research about how teens and young adults use technology for health promotion. And so when you called me a couple years ago, 
I, it was so exciting to finally like partner up because we've been working on sort of parallel tracks for so long that it was really great to finally come together. So my question for you both is where did the, the determinant come from that it was 14 to 22? Oh, I'll take that one. So Hope Lab is a foundation that's based in San Francisco, and that's their focus. They're really focused on this really interesting age group. They're people who are leaving adolescence, you know, on the cusp of adulthood. It's a really important time period, especially for emotional well-being. Um, they're creating their identities in the world. They're starting to question, you know, who they are and and what they're going to become. And Hope Lab is really focused on serving that segment of our population. And therefore, they have to understand it, which is where we come in, in terms of bringing our skills as survey researchers, bringing these representative samples um, and introducing the idea of the open-end questions and, and I'm really passionate about that because especially with this age group, but I think with anybody, you should ask them what they think and ask them to tell you in their own words because you're always going to be surprised. Yeah. Shout out to Hope Lab. We had Margaret Laws, their CEO, on Out of Patience right here. For our listeners, you can go back in the catalog and search for that show. Vicki, you work in research with children uh, do you consider 14, like, help me understand the semantics, kids, children, teenagers, adolescents, how do you unpack those definitions? Well, I mean, I, I work on issues to do with young people and technology and media. It could be anything from, you know, gender stereotypes in media to influence of violence to um, educational technology and so on. So for me, it's the gamut from, you know, birth to 18 is really what is technically considered childhood, but, you know, childhood might be more something that would end. There, there's all kinds of breaks um, in there, like uh, childhood could be up to eight, tweens, maybe eight to 12, teens, 13 to 18, young adults, 18 to 22. I care about all of them. They're all so, those, all of those age groups are so important developmentally and the role of media and technology is so important in every single one of those age groups from toddlerhood um, all the way up to young adulthood. So in terms of approaching the audience that was ripe for your studying, there's a psychology in them being of this particular age that might be different than you going after a cohort in their 60s. What was the approach you took to gain their interest and to keep them motivated that their contributions were valuable to them and other people. We ended up getting the feeling once we were in this study that this audience was sitting there waiting to be asked their opinion on this topic. So really the gist of the, of the research that we're doing here is about how young people are using social media and digital health tools to promote their own well-being. There's a huge debate going on about, oh, is social media and tech what's, you know, causing depression among young people? Or maybe it's just that, you know, young people who are depressed are sort of mindlessly sitting there and scrolling through social media. And this debate is happening amongst adults and researchers, you know, in lab coats somewhere, and nobody's stopping and talking to the young people themselves, to the teenagers, to the young adults. Social media, mobile technology, it's all a part and parcel of their lives. It's so fully integrated with their life that this age group in particular we want to talk to and the way we got them to participate and trust us and share their advice was simply by asking them and by giving them the chance to give us their responses in what's called open-ended survey questions. So it's not like a closed yes, no, or agree, disagree type question, but it's a question where we say, well, how do you use the internet to try to find other people your age who are coping with depression? And how did it work out for you? And simply by asking them that question and giving them the space in the survey to answer it, we got just a lot of participation and a lot of insight. 
I think it really speaks volumes to the fact that you were able to uncover that they were right there, ripe, were excited to be asked, and really eager to be part of something. Is that something other researchers make assumptions that that's not the case, or were you surprised to see that that was the reception? That's a great question. I, I think what, what I would say is both Vicky and I come at research with a sense of respect for the respondent. And one, and I think that's also a key to the teens and young adults participating in the survey is, is that by showing the, our respect and asking for their opinions, that's a way to build trust. And, and of course, by the way, the whole survey was conducted online in Spanish and in English, their option. Um, and we also gave the option um, to complete the survey by phone, but um, most of this cohort does want to complete the survey online. I think that I would urge more researchers to include open-end responses. It, it does take a longer amount of time to analyze those responses, to code the responses. And so what we did was have a mix of quantitative results as well as qualitative results. Okay, so you have your control group, you went through the process, you got these results, and before we talk about the results, then the pandemic hit and you had an entirely new, I don't know what you would call a catalyst, you know, you're taking a control group, it's like, it's like when doctors call your tumor elegant, it's the worst word, but it's nice, they, we don't know what they mean, but they mean something nice about it, and the worst thing to happen is to add a unilateral layer of crap on top of an existing control group. And then you can measure the delta between pre-crap, crap, and post-crap, crap. You had the luxury, the elegance, perhaps, <laughs> of having pre-crap and post-crap delta comparisons. I think that is the most, uh, maybe, unfortunate outcome of your data. So let's dig into that. What did you find out that was obvious or unsurprising in the first set in 2018? And then the longer answer, obviously, is, A, what did you find out recently? And then the delta, the difference that may or may not be terribly obvious to people. So I'm going to give credit in two ways. First, to Hope Lab and um, our initial sponsor for the 2018 survey, Wellbeing Trust. They wanted us to look really closely at depressive symptoms and at these issues of social media and digital health. And so getting that baseline was really important in 2018. And then when the pandemic hit, um, and also the racial reckoning and police violence, when there was so much turmoil in our country, I have to give credit to Vicky, who said, we have to get the band back together. We have to get back in the field. We are living through a natural experiment where these teens and young adults are under tremendous stress, we already knew that they were stressed um, because of our findings in 2018. But Vicki, I would love for you to tell the findings about people's use of social media during the pandemic and what groups we saw really hardest hit. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, it, it's not, we see it as a strength of the research, not any kind of challenge with it, because it's exactly what we wanted to do, was to see in this real world horrible situation and confluence of events. How were young people using social media? What role did it play in their mental well-being? And so the change that we saw from 2018, um, the biggest change that we see is sadly an increase in depression among teens and young adults. When we conducted the first wave of this survey in 2018, um, and I should say these are two separate, to use some geek terminology, two separate cross-sectional samples. So it's not an experiment. We don't have exactly a control group, but we have a baseline and we can track changes from the baseline. So when we did the survey then, we used this depression scale widely used to measure degree of depression among respondents. And we found a horrifying result, which was that 25% of 14 to 22-year-olds in this country exhibited symptoms of moderate to severe depression. That was shocking and distressing. And when we went back in 2020, in the fall of 2020, and did it again in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, that rate had gone up to 38%. Uh, the rates of, of depression nearly doubled among teens, uh, they went up to 
almost half of young adults, 18 to 22 year olds, 48% now have symptoms of moderate to severe depression. Now, this isn't the same as a, as a clinical diagnosis, but it's a really alarming and disturbing sign. What also increased was use of social media during this period, whether that is precisely because of the pandemic or just, you know, the trend toward more frequent use of social media. But social me- the frequency with which kids use social media went up across the board, but most strongly among those who actually are suffering from depression. So the young people who are experiencing depression are using social media more frequently. And they also say that social media have more of a positive effect on them now than they felt that it had two years ago. So when you, when we asked young people in 2018, when you're feeling down, when you're depressed, stressed, anxious, does using social media usually make you feel better? Or does it usually make you feel worse? Or does it usually not make much difference one way or the other? Well, in 2018, 27% said it usually made them feel better. And I think about 13% said it usually made them feel worse. And most said it didn't make any difference. Now, 43% say it makes them feel better. And the percent who say it makes them feel worse stayed roughly the same. So somehow or other, either what's available to young people on social media, how they've learned to use social media to promote their own well-being, something seems to be shifting, such as maybe there's a little bit of good news here that those who are struggling are able to get some help through social media. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. That was a lot of information to wrap your head around for anyone. And I'm, I, I think I'm smart, but to the extent that how would this correlate down against, say, to the school systems? Were, th- were there any baselines in the recent study as to whether the people you were surveying still had full-time school or part-time school? And, and could there be any correlating data to put forth that opening schools in states where they're still closed is much better for kids, even though we already know that, but you have data. Oh, that that would have been a great question. What we did ask people was whether they themselves and or somebody in their family have gotten sick with COVID. Um, and we also asked about effects, whether they've had loss of income or if if they if the young people had to take on additional family responsibilities. Um, like taking care of kids at home now or um, getting a job. Um, And one of the findings that was interesting, so 14% of young people said that they or a family member had actually gotten sick from the virus. And of that group, of those who have been directly touched by COVID-19, half of them say that they are experiencing symptoms of moderate to severe depression and so, and, and by the way, um, that's a group twice as likely to be black and Latinx compared to whites. 
Yeah. And we, I mean, young people have been affected by COVID in a whole variety of ways. We do also ask about whether or not they had to have their school closed. And it was a little more than half who said their school was closed. And of, you know, the young people who experienced any of these effects, we didn't look at school specifically, but any of these negative effects, loss of income in the family, um, having to take on new responsibilities, having their school close, et cetera, they were much more likely than those who have not been directly affected by COVID to experience moderate to severe depression. So I do think it's possible that everything that's happened in COVID uh, and in that in this crazy year of 2020 beyond COVID is part of what's going on with youth and mental well-being. So I recently watched the Social Dilemma a documentary, and I've, I've done shows commenting on it in the past. And it, for me, at least, it makes sense that it's all about, you know, dopamine and psyops and whatnot. But to hear you present factual evidence that when everything went to pot in this country, social media actually went up helping more people than it did in the first time you did the study. To what might you attribute that? Well, I would say there's a number of things. I mean, for young people overall, they're very likely to say that during this pandemic, social media have been really important to them in staying connected to family and friends in finding inspiration from other people, in being able to express their creativity, in getting support from others who are going through the same things that they are, in um, staying abreast of current events, in specifically in learning how to protect themselves from the virus. So these have been uh, aspects of social media use that have allowed people to maintain connections during a very trying time where we've been separated from one another. And they've been very important to all young people, but especially so to those most directly affected by COVID and especially so to those who are most affected by depression. Did you ask the questions or do you have any data on if they're using the internet for benefit at this point, where were they particularly choosing to go and what news sources or social networks or help platforms they were using? So we didn't track the platforms with this survey, um, but that does come through in the open-ended responses. Um, for example, um, on this point that Vicky just made, which I love, which which is how people look to social media for inspiration and creative expression. A 19-year-old woman wrote, I use Discord, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram to talk to friends, share my art with others, and see my friends' art and other projects. And I just also want to bring in one other group that is particularly hard hit by the isolation and, and by the trauma of 2020. And that's people who are LGBTQ. And they're um, unfortunately more likely than um, the cisgender population, straight population, to say that they are living with depressive symptoms. And they're very likely to be going online to reach out to their community. There was one quote that really, I just thought was, was really lovely. And it was from a respondent who identifies as non-binary. This person's 14 years old. And they wrote, I guess just seeing people expressing themselves the way they want makes me happy because I can't really do that. And you just think about the isolation of being 14, identifying, you know, as genderqueer, non-binary, and having a place to go online where you can find other people like you where you can get inspiration, you can, you can create things and share things. And for me, that's the ray of hope in all of this, that, that there is now a possibility for people to find each other online, uh, for people to not feel quite so alone. And during this pandemic, the kids have been able to use those resilient skills and, and find each other and find the information and resources. We have to tackle the issue of racial reckoning. We brought that up at the top of the conversation because that played a key role in as if 2020 wasn't bad enough being 
the 1928 stock market and the 1918 pandemic. It was also the 1968 social upheaval at the same time. Communities of color, LGBT, Jews, Asian Americans, they've been facing persecution writ large and this sort of systemic ignorance. And that was exacerbated last year, you know, sine qua non, like just that's what it was. Did that factor into the questioning or in the open responses from the people who took your study? It's just another level of stress on top of everything else. It did. And um, there's there's a couple of things about that. I mean, one is that we all know this. There's so much viciousness in social media and hate speech. And young people are exposed to that just like we are. And we were able to track how that has changed over the past two years. And sadly, exposure to hate speech online has gone up among teens to the point where about a quarter of them are saying they often see hate speech on social media. The folks who are in the targeted groups get the brunt of it. And so the LGBTQ youth, I think like about almost 40% of them are often seeing homophobic posts and the black and Latinx youth are, many of them are often seeing racist posts. So it is one of the negatives that plus just all of the negativity in the world is one of the downsides. I mean, we are definitely not saying that these, um, that social media and, and we want to make sure Suzanne has time to talk about all the other digital health tools that are out there, but I'm not saying that social media is just a pure positive for young people's mental well-being. There's a lot of negatives, too. I mean, we had um, a 16-year-old boy who said in our survey that social media connects you to the world, but it has also connected me to the world's problems, which have started to feel like my own. So there's... There's definitely downsides as well, but I think this is what's so interesting is, you know, it it puts, your cell phone can put the racial violence that's occurring 2,000 miles away right there in the palm of your hand while while you can watch it unfold. But at the same time, it gives young people tools to organize themselves politically and to protest virtually and, and make their experiences known and to reach out to others and share experiences. So it's definitely... Uh, a double-edged sword for sure. Right. So that puts us right back to Susanna for your reporting. And you've been in peer-to-peer health for a very long time. It's, I think, largely been anecdotal, at least in cancer. Like, it's nice to know you're not alone and we can kind of figure out the psychosocial benefits of the tribalism that it creates. But you have worked on this in genuine data. Spill the beans. (laughs) Well, what's really important to know is that these findings point to teens and young adults using all the tools at their disposal. So whether it's social media to connect with other people or going online for health information, of course, people were looking online for COVID information, but they're also trying to educate themselves about, you know, sleep and anxiety and depression and fitness. And um, they're using health apps for example, it was really interesting um, to see how many teens and young adults are trying to use these tools to take better care of themselves. Um, and it, when it comes to connection, it, it really can be an emotional question um, where you find somebody else who shares your same same your same condition. We had some quotes from people who said that they were able, for example, to connect with people who also have their same chronic condition like diabetes and get ideas about how to live with that condition. And it's just really heartening to see again, the resiliency and the, what I really feel that we need to take from this research is that people are ready to pick up the tools and we need to give them the best tools. We need to create the apps. We need to make sure that the platforms are decreasing the amount of hate speech, however that can happen, and increasing the connection because that's really what we need in this day and age. 
I, Susanna, you know, I think that it's, it, I'm interested in your view on this, but it feels like this is going to be a generational change in terms of peer-to-peer health connections, because you've got 14-year-olds here talking about how they are using various types of digital tools, social media included, to try to find others who are experiencing whatever kind of health concerns they're going through. And I think it's just part of their lives is that oh, I have this technology that enables me to reach out to others. And so, of course, I'm going to do it on a health issue just like I do on other things. Absolutely. The connection is their expectation. Yeah. And being able to solve problems together is also their expectation. So it's a very motivated, active, participatory group of people. I love the moving target analogy, though, because we're starting to look at this is the first generation to in a post-pubescent stage of life, only know about online and have less offline social interaction than perhaps we did riding our bikes through the woods, not knowing where our parents were and getting called and bullhorned home at seven o'clock when they shouted in the street, Matt, come home for dinner. (laughs) We're way past that. So this is a grand experiment per se. Final question, And then I want to really wrap up on how our listeners can get this report, really digest it, and then learn what's next for the report. Are you able to comment at all, and this might be a very lengthy conversation, on how the depression and anxiety exacerbation, some of these are like 200% over the first time you took the study, have factored into reports on increased teen suicide and college student suicide? Well... In our survey, we did not ask any questions about suicide or suicidal ideation simply because it's a survey. And if somebody tells you they're thinking about that, we can't do anything to help them in that moment. So um, but obviously, depression is up. Severe depression is up. And I do think we do see, as you look at the gradations on this scale of depressive symptoms that we included in our survey, a very small proportion of our respondents, about 5%, had symptoms of severe depression. It's too small of a group numerically for us to draw any hard and fast conclusions about in this particular survey, but we do find that they look really different even than those young people who are suffering from moderate or moderately severe levels of depression. And for them, they make a lot of use of digital health tools. Social media is more of a mixed bag for them. It's even more of a lifeline sometimes in helping them not to feel alone, but it can also make them feel even more anxious than they do. So I think whether we're thinking about the positive or the negative aspects of um, tech use among those who are most severely depressed, we need more research and we have to think about it a lot more carefully. I think the bottom line of this research is there is no one size fits all answer to to this issue. There are adults who are saying, you know, the problem with the increasing rates of depression among young people is that they're on their smartphones all the time. So if we just get them to spend less time on their smartphones, then we've solved the problem of depression. I think that's really uh, overly simplistic and, and maybe even dangerously simplistic. And I think what this research points to is that for some young people, the reason that their social media use is increasing along with their depression is because they are proactively and purposefully using social media and other digital health tools, health apps, telehealth connections to providers and therapists, looking up health information online. They're proactively and purposefully using those tools to help address their own mental well-being. So if you were to sum up Any one big aha takeaway from the research and what might be a next step for it, what would that be? Well, for me, it's that young people are using digital health tools extensively and that if we're not meeting them in the online world with digital tools that are designed for them, then we're missing a huge opportunity. Specifically, Typically underserved populations like LGBTQ youth are really um, actively using online tools, and we have to be 
making services that are culturally appropriate available to them online. I'll bring up again um, something that Vicki just touched on, which is the telehealth services. We saw a real increase in the number of teens and young adults who are meeting with clinicians online, whether it's um, through video or text. And I think that we should look at this data as um, a strengthening of policy recommendations, that this should be a service that's available, not just in pandemic times, but again, we need to meet people where they are um, for mental health support, for sick care, wherever it is, we should remove any policy barriers that keep people back from being able to connect with clinicians. Susanna Fox, recurring guest here on Out of Patients, is a health and technology researcher. Vicki Rideout, best last name ever, is a researcher on children and media. And you can learn more about this study by visiting commonsense.org. Thank you both for shedding light on this extraordinary research. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. If you like today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seeley, Jen Orange, and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seeley. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.